Now, introducing my, my next guest um, is a good friend of mine, actually, Dr David Gillespie. Now, David entered Parliament in 2013 after practising for 33 years as a medical doctor. I'm just going to get out of this blue light before I go blind. <laughs> utilising radiotherapy in diagnosing and treating diseases. He was double certified as a general internal specialist and a gastroenterologist. This is his fourth term as for the member of Lyme. During the Turnbull and Morrison governments, he served as Assistant Minister for Health, Assistant Minister for Rural Health, Assistant Minister for Children and Families and Minister for Regional Health, as well as Leader of the House and Minister Assisting the Minister for Trade. During his time in the Health Executive, he was a minister responsible for the Australian Radiation Protection and Nuclear Safety Agency. His committee service includes serving briefly as the Chair of the House of Reps Standing Committee on Energy and the Environment in the 45th Parliament and as a member in the 46th Parliament. He travelled to India with the committee to inspect the country's long-standing full civil nuclear cycle capabilities. During this time, he served on the committee's 2019 inquiry, Not Without Your Consent, which was a way forward for nuclear energy in Australia. That committee has now been dissolved and with a change of government and is now titled The Climate Change, Environment, Energy and Water. Committee. 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 He's also served on a chaired committee, on, or, or chaired committee, sorry, um, on Communications, Cyber Safety and the Arts, Joint Standing Committee on Public Accounts and Audit, and the Joint Standing Committee on Trade and Investment Growth. He established the Parliamentary Friends of Nuclear Industries in the 46th Parliament, which continues in the 47th, a multi-partisan caucus educating parliamentarians about Australia's nuclear capabilities and civil nuclear power around the world. National and international expert briefings facilitated by this group have catal catalyst shifts in the way people think and talk about nuclear energy. And as we know, and we just heard from Stephen, we've really got to change the way we talk about nuclear. In 2022, uh, he started his travels around the world to experience nuclear and how they do that around the world. He travelled with three Australian engineers to Canada to meet with the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission and was briefed on the CNSC federal regulatory structures, as well as meeting and being briefed on the Honourable Todd Smith, Minister for Energy, Province of Ontario. The delegation also visited the Power Generation Nuclear Operations Site in Toronto. And you can go into that if you wanted to. Uh, because for the rest of us, those letters won't really mean much. <laughs> OPG is the public power utility that owes and operates 19 nuclear facilities, as well as gas and hydro plants across Canada and America. The delegation was thoroughly briefed by the most senior GEH engineers and corporate leaders on a complete day in North Carolina and USA. The delegation had an inside tour of the nuclear fuel fabrication plant, and received a virtual internal inspection of the Hitachi SMR. Can you put your hands together and welcome David. Thanks. Can you hear me? No. That's better? That's better? OK. Well, thanks, Kimberly, and thanks, Steve. That was a tour de force. A picture tells a thousand words. So you've got millions of words out there. I've got more pictures than you can poke a stick at, so I'll try and be quick. Um, but uh, like, you, like uh, Kimberly just outlined, I've been using uh, radiation and nuclear isotopes and nuclear medicine to diagnose and treat and cure people. People have a bad idea about radiation. The biggest source of radiation you're going to get in your life is the sun. Okay? Or if you, you know, un unlucky in life and you get a cancer and you have yeah. hundreds of CAT scans or that, that's about it. Um, or if you're an international jet pilot or maybe if you are working in a mine, they limit how much you get exposed to. But for most of us, um, it's minuscule. Uh, I have got a collection of slides here 
which I will need to speed date everyone through because I don't want to keep you too long. But the nuclear fuel fabrication that we saw are these little pellets. You can hold them in your hand like a pack of marbles. That's purified uranium pellets, okay? Uh, they put them in rods four metres high and uh, like they have a thread needle going down them. They've got little barriers between them made of zirconium and, and they're the fuel rods that go inside a reactor which is basically a kettle. A kettle because I'm going to show you some pictures. Uh, the take-out message, see all those big numbers? 440 around the world, 60 under construction, 89 more planned and uh, heaps more because the whole world's worked out. If we've got to get off fossil fuels, the way to go is uh, with nuclear. And why I brought up this one is to give you a, an idea of the density of those little beads. They're not going to irradiate me by having them in my hand. Like when we went to the factory, they're dressed like you. No one's wearing lead. When I was a doctor and putting wires in people and scanning them, I had to wear lead because the image intensifier had radiation. I had to wear lead glasses, a big gown. But when you're in a nuclear fabrication, you walk around like this. It's only if you jump inside a nuclear reactor where you've got hundreds of these little beads all packed together and they start what's called fission and little neutrons bump into each other and they get hot. So these rods end up being like uh, the element of a kettle that used to have electricity running through it to get red hot and boil your water. Well, that's what a nuclear plant does. It boils water. Now, the first thing you've got to remember is civil nuclear power plants are only got enriched uranium. The percentage of uranium in that that's the highly fissile uh, 235 uranium is 3 to 5 percent, okay? Um, that's like 3 carat gold, you know, 24 carat gold, you know, 100 percent pure gold. Okay, for uranium power reactors that are boiling water, most of them, the standard ones, are 3 to 5 percent. You know what you need for a bomb? You need 95 percent plus, plus an awful lot of gelignite, hydrogen liquid which is highly explosive you need packed with physical explosions and it has to be like 95 percent pure and you need about 10 15 kilos so even if a terrorist turned up at lucas heights where our current reactor is in the middle of suburban sydney and threw a hand grenade over the over the fence you would see a hand grenade go off you would not see a bomb the next myth i want to just distinguish for you is when Fukushima um, had the meltdown and the explosion, you sure? That was an explosion of hydrogen gas. Okay. When you have these reactors that are clad with zirconium, like a lot of metals are reduced, uh, hydrogen's involved in reducing metals, uh, but hydrogen is produced out of the split water. If the temperature goes above 400, 500 degrees, plus the hydrogen in the metals leaches out and a bubble of hydrogen built up in the Fukushima reactor because the circulating water that cooled everything stopped. The, the tsunami killed 40,000 people, but there was no one killed by radiation. Zero, zippo, none. In the inquiry, we looked into that. I've been to Japan. I've met with Japanese people in Australia no one got killed by radiation. Everyone's freaking out because of the water left over, because left over tritium. It's below normal water. It's been so purified. Um, it's not going to hurt anyone. Um, but if they had used advanced designs of these things and had their diesel pumps up above where the tsunami was, the Fukushima nuclear plant would still be working now. Now, up in Calide Power Station, in Queensland, it blew up about 18 months, two years ago. Guess what explosion that was? Hydrogen. hydrogen. Okay, they were ramping it up and down beyond its means, and the hydrogen that cools the generator um, got exposed to air. Air and, and hydrogen explodes. Okay, 
the Hindenburg disaster, that big Zeppelin that blew up, it cracked somewhere and hydrogen got exposed and it blew up. So um, Chernobyl was really bad, okay? It had lots of graphite in it and it had a hydrogen explosion too, but the graphite blew the whole lid of the whole massive thing up and all the graphite dust went off into the air, okay? So that was significant, but depending on who you read, and you never know with Russia, but at the moment it's a national park, okay? The other thing you gotta remember is um, uh, the plants Zaporizhia uh, in Ukraine, they've all been turned off. And Russia is never gonna blow them up because they have a big business, it's called nuclear power plants and nuclear fuel. So they can't go blowing it up, that's where they get a lot of their money. So those three things, Nuclear power plants don't irradiate you unless you happen to break into it, weld open the top of it, jump in and swim around with it, otherwise you're not going to get radiated. If you drive past it, in Lucas Heights, there's blocks of land that go for one and a half million dollars, a couple hundred metres away. The people that live there know. And waste, that's the last thing I'll say, and then I'll show you all these pretty slides. Waste. Everyone says, oh, waste, we've got this big, huge problem. Hello, they sought out how to do that in about 1960, okay? When you burn the, you, the fission, there are leftover things. All the little neutrons change uranium into some plutonium, into what are called transuranics. All these little invisible neutrons, that's how they make radioisotopes to diagnose your cancer or your thyroid or to treat you. That's what the reactor in Lucas Heights is. But in a nuclear reactor, after a year or two, they have to take that out. And what we do with our leftover, it's not waste, it's really valuable stuff. You can use it again, you just gotta separate out all the things, the cesium, tritium, americanum, and all these other ums, um, which we give to France. They take all the valuable stuff out, then they use the leftover uranium, they put it back into those little beads that I showed you, and they whack it into their reactors. And we pay them a mozza to do that. And then we store it in a big shed at Lucas Heights. It's a big cylinder, about as big as this. Here we go. I've got dodgy legs at the moment. I played cricket and ruptured all my quads. So that's why I look like a stick man. But anyhow, it's about, it would fit here, Steve. Anyone who wants to go for a tour on Lucas Heights, it's open to the public. They had 40,000 people through it. You can stand over the reactor. It's open. That's why it's called the Opal Reactor. All that scary doo -doo. Can you start playing the scary music? <laughs> and the deep voice, there's a nuclear reactor beneath you. And you're wearing a surgical gown, no lead anywhere. And you can look into it. Because guess what? The neutrons and the any radiation is stopped by water. So it never even gets out of it. Okay, so controlled civil nuclear power stations are wonderful things because you can see, oh, what happened to my... The energy density, look, enriched uranium in a light water reactor, like firewood, what the cavemen worked out, and up until coal was discovered, uh, the energy density of 16 compared to a barrel of oil, minuscule. Look at this, 3,000, 3,900,000 times, okay? So the density you can get, but the way we turn it into energy is just like, you know, the rocket, the first steam engine. Those little rods are the element for the reactor pressure vessel and the water boils or some of these advanced ones, they have gas or they have molten lead and that creates huge hot gas or huge hot steam, which runs a steam generator, which then spins the electrical generator, which then, and the generator is basically big magnets wrapped around copper, spinning round, and hey presto, electrons run down the copper wire. That's how electricity is made. And a diesel generator uses a diesel engine to do the same spinning. A hydro uses water to do the same thing. And nuclear is just doing that. So we'll move on from that. I just wanted to show you that density bit. So, oh, sorry. Uh, got the right. Here we go. 
I thought I had them all open for you, but we'll just go again. That's okay. We had a we had a forum in Parliament in November. I got eight of the Australia's best engineers. They all spoke about everything. It's wonderful. If you ever want to look at it, you can see all these talks on Friends of Nuclear Industries in um, YouTube. Okay, so the 101, I've given you most of their... Okay, so that's just a diagram of Bart Simpson, and a lot of people know about as much as Bart Simpson. So Kimberly asked me to just explain the basics, and I've told you a bit of that. Um, but the fission bit is... High tech assistance, please. Sorry, we're gonna have to. That's that's what I just told you about. Um, fission is a wonderful thing. When you when you dig up uranium, uh, it's mixed in with two types, and when you enrich it, uh, the two thirty five variety bounces more of those electrons around. So they purify it just like you purify gold. They make it into those little pellets, put big bundles of them, and then there's lots of bundles, and then they reach criticality, just like when you're trying to start a fire and rubbing it, like, you know, the Australian Aboriginals did to make a fire. Okay, well, if you keep piling it, piling it, and you put water that slows down the neutrons, that makes it get hotter, and you need less uranium. Okay, and that's criticality. And then, hey presto, they're bouncing around all over the place and the pressure builds up and away you go. That's a picture of what the rods look like. Okay? There's hundreds of them. And if I was standing there about there. Okay? Um, this is a diagram of what a, what's called a pressurised water reactor looks like. Here we go. These are the zirconium rods. That metal is zirconium. And in these boiling water reactors or pressurised water reactors, which is um, the really hot steam, boils this in a separate circuit, which brings, runs the steam turbine, which spins the generator, and away you go. And everything goes back. And when you see nuclear power plants and all that steam coming out of the big... That, that's, that's steam. People, same, same in a coal plant. Um, those that, where the uh, bad stuff comes out is the little skinny, tall things. But most of that is steam. Um, now, around the world, you can see the PWR, that's a pressurised water reactor, that, and the boiling water reactor, they are pretty simple technology. They're the kettles. Uh, no fancy stuff, but there are bucket loads of them around the world. And the rest of the world has discovered, hey presto, if we think you're going to get to net zero using renewables, like they said in the movie, tell him he's dreaming. Like, you just can't do it because you're expecting way too much. Not only is it low energy density, it's variable. It's dependent on the weather. Um, Stephen mentioned capacity factor. Any energy system, if you've got a low capacity factor and low efficiency, the engineers have explained it to me, capacity factor means the percentage of time on average over a year that any generating source is actually generating electricity. Okay? That's a capacity factor. Efficiency is what energy you put in for what energy you get out, which is a slightly different thing. But renewables... Uh, God bless their socks, are low on both counts. And the big fault in the logic of smattering them around Australia is a false logic, particularly as our East Coast grid is all in the same night and day cycle, maybe at an hour and a half difference. So, look, at the t it's generating... But if clouds blow over, it can stop. If it's a cloudy day, nothing happens. If it's raining, storm, tempest, or 
just when you see these big lows, there's plenty of times when we have monsoonal things come across Northern Territory, Queensland and New South Wales. It's all covered. So everyone thinks, particularly Germans, who I spent two days with, they think we've just got so much sun, we can make renewables till the cows come home. But actually it averages out at about 22% which is fantastic. It's 100% better than England or even more. They've got only 9%. Places up in Korea and Northern Asia, they're cloudy a bit like England. So that's why they got into nuclear. That's why they rely on our gas and our coal. They, they you know, it's, it's simple one-on-one stuff. Now, the United Arab Emirates, I went there and I saw that when it was sand dunes. In 2014, I went for a five-day tour. The Crown Prince asked a couple of Aussies to go over there and I was picked for one of them. And we saw it and we got briefings from them. We saw lots in the Emirates. It's pretty amazing what they've done out of sand dunes using their oil wealth. They've decided it's much better if we generate electricity, save the gas, sell it and make money, or save the oil, sell that and make money, and we'll make our electricity out of this. Now, none of that was there in 2014. 1,400 megawatts, each one of those, okay? So 5,600 megawatts, that's 5.6 gigawatts. The installed capacity for our remaining New South Wales coal plants is about seven. So they've gone from zero to almost what, all of what we've got in 10 years, okay? Uh, they decided back in about 2008, they knew nothing about nuclear. We actually are a pretty savvy nuclear nation. We have got so much experience. We've been operating three reactors. We've got ANSTO with 1,200 scientists in it. Um, we've, we're on all the regulatory bodies all around the world. We've been involved since the 1950s. Um, uh, we've got our Panzer, which I administered, which now is uh, checking up on the nuclear subs. So we have got huge capacity in this country. Whereas the Arabs, they had to start from scratch. They knew a bit about oil and gas, but they had no nuclear experience. So they went through a process that took them four years to get all the regulatory structures in place. But we've got 95% of that already. If we flick the switch and remove the prohibitions, there'll be a stampede of people who want to come to this country and, and, and um, save us from the national suicide. So look, this is to show you, this is like Volvos, like iPhones, you know, Apple, Apple phone, iPhone 1, we're up to 14. Well look, this is the evolution since the 1950s. The ones that you're hearing a lot of that are in the small modular space, well, the first small modular ones were way down here, okay? They had small modular ones running four army camps around Alaska and the windswept parts of America. But they realised it's much more efficient to build a big one rather than have lots of little ones. But there's yin and yang for both sides. But in the... In the uh, 60s, a lot of these are still operating from the 1960s. They're quite safe. When we went to India, they had one that's been operating for 80 years. You know India, how they've got cows roaming around and you see huge slums, but they are really technically competent. They were like us in the 1950s, all set to go into a full nuclear production. They did. And they've got about 25,000 people it makes a profit every year. Their nuclear power program, they're going to have about another eight big power plants. They're looking at small modular ones too. Guess what? Bangladesh, why? they're building a nuclear plant. Hey, you know, Bangladesh. Countries in Africa, you know, South Africa, they've still got a big nuclear reactor. They had another one that's a bit dodgy. Um, and they're, they're very advanced in small modular reactors. The can do is a Canadian designed um, reactor of which there's 22 in Canada, but they're also in Europe, in South America, Argentina and Brazil have got can do's. Um, 
And the Canadians are like us. They want to help us. We have a treaty with them on nuclear cooperation. They don't have bombs, they, but they have everything else. They dig up uranium like us. They enrich it like we used to do till 1987. Um, they manufacture everything. They've got about 40,000 people working in their nuclear industry. And that's why all the builders, all the uh, operators at Stanwell, they realise, hey, nuclear jobs, they're high paid, high technical, secure jobs. Um, they want to help us. They've got uh, advanced generation three, which is called three plus, can do's. They'll be down here. It's like Volvo's. You know, the 1940 Volvo was pretty solid, but then they got crash zones, then they got um, seat belts, then they got side impacts, then they got sensors. It's the same. Every time they do a new generation, they've got new safety features. And these generation ones, they have got small versions of these. And these generation four ones are generally all small, but they can be up to 300, 400 uh, megawatts. Anything under 300 is generally called small. But the good thing about the SMR, small modular reactor, they have learnt from all the advances in the big reactors, but with the small and the new technology in the fourth generation ones, these small ones, pound for pound, can produce even more energy. Like the Terra Power, the salt, molten salt reactor that Bill Gates is involved in, designed by GE Itachi, um, that, for the amount of nuclear, en um, nuclear material, it's a hundred times more efficient than these big ones. And they've got very advanced passive safety features. They can be micro-modular, you know, down to one megawatt, five megawatts, 100 megawatts, can be in containers. You can stick them up on mines out in um, uh, remote uh, uh, mining sites. If the miners want to go green, hey, Twiggy should give up on the hydrogen. I could tell you a good joke about renewable energy. You want to hear it? Yeah. Hydrogen. <laughs> it's like, no. Look, there's a lot of things. You've got to make hydrogen. It's going to have a place, maybe in fuel cell vehicles, but it's not going to be a mass transit solution. Everyone thinks, oh, you know, we can make hydrogen easy. It's quite involved. Methane reforming using coal and gas. You use renewable electricity to um, do um, elect uh, not electrophoresis, yeah, um, ele electrolysis, not electrophoresis. I'm getting my medical procedures mixed up here, yeah. Um, so, but hey, presto, the beauty of of nuclear plants is they produce electricity from the steam spinning the turbines or the hot gas heating and spinning the turbines, but. In Europe and coal places, they provide heating for whole cities. Like we have pipes delivering gas, they have steam running around, and the Finnish people love it. And these small ones, because they're so small and they're so passively safe, you know, they're ultra safe, they're planning on putting them... There's already nuclear reactors in many universities in America, like on the third floor. They have a little training reactor. They're totally safe. People don't freak out because they're used to it. There's 92 in the whole of America. Like I said, Canada, just like us. They're small, they're British, they've got King Charles, they used to have QE2, now KC3. They've got upper house and lower house. They've got all the indigenous sensitivities because everything has to go through the First Nations. They want to help us and we've got an agreement. That's why I went over there because I was trying to get an MOU so that we could send our guys over there and learn how they regulate it, copy their system, bring it back here. But unfortunately we had a change of government and the rest is history. So these give you some fancy diagrams of the fourth generation ones, but they're all the same. They have the central bit where the rods are. They also make them in the shape of pebbles. Not only have they made the whole machine passively safe, you know how I was telling you about Fukushima? The tsunami came through and wiped out and killed thousands. 
but it wiped out the diesel pumps in the electric, electricity system that ran the circulating cooling water. And the diesel uh, tanks that ran all the backup was actually right on the wharf. How dumb was that? And, um, but uh, because of things like that, they've designed passive safety systems in these fourth generation ones, which they copied from the big generation three plus. So the big three plus ones, they can run for 72 hours, nothing's required. They've got natural circulation, they've got a pool of water, it'll keep it cool, and then you can come in and fill it up till you can at your leisure fix up whatever's gone wrong, re-establish uh, power, so that you can't have Fukushima's anymore, you can't have Chernobyl's anymore, unless you look up the plans for a 1950 nuclear plant and try and copy the 1950 designs. Um, yeah, so, and see these ones here, these very high temperature reactors? The wonders of these things is um, nuclear waste, that problem that has already got protocols, how it's managed, they burn used fuel so that there's even less waste. And um, that is going to be part of the recipe for any modern country that's starting up. You would, in the committee of inquiry that we did, it was called Not Without Your Consent, The Way Forward for Nuclear in Australia, we said, OK, the only ones that get a gig are those. All these ones, their history, we are going to be the beneficiaries of it. People at Anstel have been designing one of these Generation 4 things. We're part of the international forum designing and approving what goes into them. That shows you how, how involved we are. It's just that we tie our hands behind our back and we bulldoze all these beautiful areas that shouldn't have any solar farm. You just build a little plant, for goodness sake, you know. When the power and the, the life of the coal plants are over, you just whack in, you know, uh, AP1000 or a couple of SMRs that are 300. Because a lot of the power plants, coal plants, actually have four power plants. Okay, when uh, Elbow and Bowen say, oh, you know, you've got to have 75 of them around the country. Well, no, you don't. There's only 16 sites where you put power stations if you're replacing coal. Okay, and they've got 10 mile radius of everything cleared. Whereas the new, these, America has approved them. Like, you could put an SMR in America inside a uni on the third, down in the dungeon. Okay, or you could... You could whack one in Parliament House, easy. Okay? That's the size of them, okay? Um, now, this is, uh, this is the other good thing I want to tell you about. These are the temperatures of the early ones, okay? But the Generation 4 ones are these ones that go up to 1,200 degrees. So that means you don't need oil and gas. You can use the very high temperature gas reactors to use, use fuel and waste, you can add thorium to them and even less waste. That's a different thing altogether. Um, but the one that Bill Gates is building in Wyoming, that's a molten salt reactor that produces pound for pound about 100 times more than the three plus generation ones. But the three plus and the threes will be around for another 20, 40 years. The Canadians are refitting them. They're refurbishing their whole lot and they will have um, 80 years running, okay? Even the Indians are proud that they've already got, it'll be uh, 85 years running now. One of their ones from 1950 is still, still operating because they maintain it, you know? Um, but it, it's, this process heat means you don't have to use gas or coal or oil or diesel generators. You can use it for, like I said, district heating. You can use it for desalination, pulp and paper manufacturing, methanol production. Um, that's an industrial process that needs a lot of energy, desulfurisation of oil, petroleum reform, and a lot of 
hydrogen. If we're going to use it instead of fossil, liquid fossil fuels, it, you can't just run a factory to make hydrogen based on the wind or the sun. Particularly, as I said, in Australia, we've got some of the best sun, and we're still only at 22% averaged over a year. And um, uh, what, what city is going to say, guys, it's sunny this week, everyone come to work? <laughs> or it's going to rain all week, so stay at home? Like, seriously? Uh, when people talk about baseload, that's another thing that people don't understand. Baseload energy is an amount. It's still the same. It's baseload is the amount that your grid never goes below. Okay? Because there's even when you're fast asleep in your house, you can run on your battery, but there's 7,000 megawatts in the middle of the night when you think everything's turned off, keeping everything running in New South Wales. Okay? Like fridges, factories, water, sewerage, railways, lights, traffic lights, lifts. You know, the, there's all this stuff that the nuts and bolts that most of us don't see unless you're in the industry or you're running these big things. And you know what some of the biggest draw of power now is? Data centres. Okay? I don't want to disappoint Microsoft, but if they think they're going to come down here and build nine big, massive data centres, uh-oh. Because I was at a meeting in Perth about four years ago. There's this thing called the American-Australian Leadership Dialogue. And you know how um, Google and Microsoft, a lot of people went to Ireland because they got low tax rates, that helps. Um, but they've got a lot of their, they base their European stuff there. Well, the head of Microsoft then is obviously not the head now or he doesn't know a lot about Australia, that we're going to retire 80% of our coal stations by 2035. Um, the data centres um, won't have enough baseload energy uh, because uh, he told me, he said, we can't expand in Ireland anymore. We're going to expand back in the US and have more data centres because they've got energy. Or we'll go to France because they've got nuclear. Or they'll go to Canada. Like VW has just signed a $20 billion contract to make V-dubs and electric vehicles, not in Germany, because they ain't got enough power. They're going to, wait for it, Ontario, Canada, because they have got cheap energy, half of what we pay now. Okay, so all those industrial processes, now this is a little mini reactor that's the Westinghouse Evinci 5 megawatt one. That's about the size of it. That's two big containers. Okay? Um, there are, in the fourth generation, there's also new fuels. You saw those little pellet things that I showed you. But they also make a pebble, sh pebble shape um, called triso, which is all the chemical names. It's easier to just. But the, the uranium, instead of a dilute little pellet, they've got about 20% enrichment, but they're cased in layers of stuff that won't let uh, anything explode or, or spread. So they can last for 20 years, and they just drop new pebbles in and the old pebbles drop out. So they don't even have to pull the things out. That's triso fuel. Now, I will go to a, a few other quick things. Now that's a picture of the reactor. I walked inside that in a virtual sense. They've got it all designed. It's all ready to go. It's going through licensing. In Canada they have the best licensing system for small modular reactors. Consequently, everyone in the world that's making a, a small modular reactor is heading to Canada because they've got the most sensible regulatory system. They, they try and help you. It's sort of like how councils used to be. You know? But now when you get a DA, they work out ways to slow you down. Well, that's what America did for the last 30 years. You wonder why not much got built in America, because there was obstruction at a regulatory level. Um, but this little thing, that's a car there. So that 300 megawatt plant, we have walked in with our um, 3D virtual, and we've been in the plant next door that makes the rods, 
and they showed us everything, told us how much it had cost, but we had to sign our life away. But I can tell you, I've got some info on that. Now, that shows you why we need nuclear. If we are going to get rid of the black stuff and the brown stuff, that's South Australia. They're tiny. 1,700 megawatts. Like, our base load is, is 7,000. They will ring, they'll ring up the newspapers and say, hey, today we got 78% or 90% renewable energy. Well, that was for about 40 minutes when every turbine was moving and everyone was fast asleep. But you saw what happened, you know? They had a windstorm. When there's too much wind, the voltage and the frequency goes berserk and they can't operate. The spike of electricity when that storm happened blew the extension cord into Victoria called the interconnector because it's only got so much capacity, okay? So it's sort of like a fuse to protect Victoria as well as to allow two-way flow. And we could replace all those things with nuclear if we chose to, okay? Now, low emissions technology, if you want to go low, small modular reactors um, with uranium, 12 grams of CO2 um, per, kilowatt, per kilowatt hour. Hydro is 24. Um, big solar farms is 48. Onshore wind is pretty low. But because there's a new way that they can get the uranium out of the ground called in situ leaching, they don't have to dig big holes and go down burrows. They just track it and they run chemicals down and leach it up. So there's no big holes anymore. And um, I'd love to go over to Olympic Dam and see how it all works. I'm a nuts and bolts person. In my next life, I'm coming back as an engineer. OK, so I've told you a lot of that. Um, uh, I think you know all that. But that's the people have got to realise nuclear is clean. It's the ultimate green thing. And these are some of the advantages. I'll just quickly get through them. But um, independent of the weather. Capacity factor, 95% versus 18%. Load following, yes, you can ramp it up. Um, you can unleash the hot salt and the four, uh, 420 megawatts can go over 500 in Bill Gates's one in Wyoming. Um, it can if you do have a blackout. You know, they're spinning, they're ready to go. You just uh, synchronise them with everything and away you go. As opposed to if you blackout like South Australia, they had no capacity to start up a system. It's quite an involved thing. You've got to have a critical amount all coming on gradually without shorting things. And uh, that's why they were without it for, for days. You don't need to store anything. The storage is in the, the uranium, you know. Some, you, you've got 10 years of energy if you do one of those new pebble beds with triso-fuel. Hey, that's storage, not batteries. Batteries cost an absolute mozza. And the other thing people don't realise is everyone talks about peak oil, which might have happened, you know, before the last recession. But the amount of minerals, we've had talks in Canberra and it's a, a whole new uh, thing to talk about. We'll have to do about 100 times more mining. Um, Professor Simon Michaud, uh, from uh, the geo, the Finnish uh, geoscience equivalent. Um, he's a University of Queensland trained um, uh, geometallurgist. He is changing the world at warp speed because he has said, hang on guys, I know metals, I know where they all are. I know on average you've got to have about 20 discoveries to get three viable mines and it takes about 20 years. And with all these cars and all these 28,000 kilometres of wires and batteries and electric vehicles, it's not sustainable. It's sold as green. But Boris Johnson's dictum that by 2030 everyone has to have an electric vehicle, the UK market would consume the whole world's known copper. Okay? 
the amount of copper we will have to mine between now and 2030 is going to be the same as what we've mined since about 1780 when records started. Because all the ore bodies that were easy to get at, they've all been found. Now they've got to dig deeper or look further or go to places that haven't been discovered. So you're going to have peak minerals before you have peak oil. Now a few quick diagrams. We talked about capacity factor. Okay, an SMR has a 95% capacity factor. 100% for a 100 megawatt plant, you get that full black line. You get uh, 876 gigawatts hours per year. So 120,000 homes for a year constantly. Um, 95 from a solar, uh, from a SMR, 832. Wind, okay, there's your problem. But that's best case scenario, because there are some weeks, like, like Stephen showed, there are some days when there's no wind. You can have all the geographic spread all around the country, there's sweet, like are all wind, and there's no solar. So there's not enough batteries in the world to keep Australia going that long. So capacity factor really kills. And why our electricity's got expensive is that because we have regulations in the market, and targets, even cheap coal has artificially had its capacity factor wound down because, hey presto, it's a sunny day and the NEM rings them up and say, guys, shut down. And they're pulling their hair out, going broke, um, because it takes a couple of days. So they've got to just let the steam go. So it makes them inefficient. Any system on low capacity factor means your cost is going to go through the roof. And I will... That gives you an idea of the overnight capital cost for a new build. Okay? What is SMR on the far right? Okay? 5,316. I mentioned... Um, that's a comparison of what you would get if you were doing solar versus SMR. Okay? Except you've got 95, that's the, the dollar difference. But hey presto, you spend a fortune and you still have, a lot of the time, you have no energy. So we need, if we're going to shut down coal, we need to have nuclear. And there's a few, I mentioned that the critical mineral requirements is off the Richter scale uh, for offshore wind. The steel and the cement Onshore wind is a little bit less, but down the bottom there, uh, SMRs uh, look pretty good. Now, the other thing is, uh, you can see on the colours, colour scheme there, the nuclear one is down here, tiny, for the material resources. Hundreds times more of all those precious, hard to get things needed for solar panels, and the magnetos in wind turbines, let alone all the steel, concrete, copper, and the transmission lines. It's just mind-boggling. People haven't stopped to think. That shows the concrete difference. Uh, Kennedy Energy Park in Hewenden, okay? That's the amount of concrete in tonnes per terawatt hour. The deep blue is nuclear, yellow is solar, and look at that, wind. It consumes so many resources. And as Stephen said, it only lasts about 20 years, max. Now, these are, this is national suicide. Economies around the world. If you don't have an electricity system, you don't have an economy. The digital world, all those things that run, we are shutting down these plants because we have fragmented the market. It used to be a vertically integrated state system, state by state by state. But this madness can happen because we've got national electricity rules that favour one over the other. None of these wind farms would happen, both at sea and on land. The clever people who write on publicly have analysed Infogen and Iberdola and squadron energy, 
The only reason they're in the black is their large generating certificates. Why there is this stampede, that's renewable energy certificates. When you put them on your roof or you put a heating um, system on your roof for solar or a heat pump, you get small scale certificates which go off to a different market. But for the big stuff, they bundle up, they do the sums, multiply it by this mythical capacity factor, they work out how much they bundle it all up and then they sell it off as a power purchase agreement. But hey presto, on those 68 days, when it's not windy and it's not sunny, guess where they get the energy from? From coal <laughs> and gas. And Canberra does that and say we're 100% renewable because they get contracts from these people. But really, they're just getting the electrons from the baseload system. So we, it is madness. We need to get rid of the prohibitions. Uh, and I could talk all night under wet cement, even under a wind turbine. But uh, yeah, we just got to remove the prohibition. Uh, thanks for asking me along here. And I hope I've demystified many of the fears. But trust me, waste is minuscule. You know, I, I tried for about a week to get a thing off LinkedIn which shows, uh, it's a beautiful picture, shows the grand total of the waste of 90 reactors in America since the 1950s, the nuclear waste fits in one baseball field. Wow. Okay? That's, That's the high level stuff. And who gives a rats if it's 500 feet underground? I don't care what the half-life is. But the other thing is, have you seen exponential up and exponentially down? Most of the decaying and the uh, isotopes uh, half-life drops off in the first 50 or 60 years. They keep the waste on site in a pool of water and then they take them out. We send ours over to France. Americans, they just bury it. The UK bury it, but a lot of people use France. Reprocess it, make moxie fuel, and um, just the leftover bits, they turn into valuable isotopes. That's what the Indians are doing. They're on the full cycle. They do digging it up, refining it, making it, nuclear medicine, and they are just burying their stuff 500 metres underground because it's totally safe and it's tiny. Look at Australia. How big are we? And we would need half the Sydney cricket ground to keep us somewhere to put nuclear waste for a thousand years. That's how small. It's very heavy, it's very dense, but it's tiny. Sorry, Thanks very much. Thank you, David. That was amazing. Thank you, David.